Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And well, <laughs> well, we'll just enjoy the bell for a minute. I love the bell. Good morning. My name is Jacob Hunter, and I'm the pastor here at Industry United Methodist Church, and I welcome you here, those of you that are here in the sanctuary worshiping with us uh, in person, and those who are online worshiping, uh, we give thanks to uh, you all for being here with us as well. I invite you to stand as you're able and join in our call to worship. Rejoice, people of God, this is our Sabbath day. Rejoice, friends in Christ, this is our time for worship. God ordained the Sabbath, rest and restoration. God is worthy of worship, our creator, healer, and inspiration. So then now let us worship God. I invite you to remain standing as you are able and join in our opening hymn. It's number 263 in the hymnal. It's uh, titled, When Jesus the Healer Passed Through Galilee. Uh, we're only going to sing the first five verses, so verses one through five. All right, there's a whole lot, so yeah. Please be seated. I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer for the opening prayer. Loving and caring God, we come this morning seeking wisdom and guidance for our lives. Open to us, open us to your words of life and love and truth. May we proclaim with our tongues what we know in our hearts. In this time of worship, help us more fully understand what it means to truly be a disciple, a follower of the way of Jesus, a follower of the path of wisdom. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we prepare to hear God's word for us this morning, I invite you to turn in your faith. We sing the little skinny black book in front of you to number 2164 for our centering hymn. It's Sanctuary. We'll sing it through two times.
you'll bow your heads for the prayer of illumination. God of all creation, send your Holy Spirit among us this day, that the seed of your word might take root in our hearts and bear the fruits of peace, love, and justice for all. Amen. The gospel reading this morning is Luke 13, 10 through 17, and it can be found on your pew five. Uh, real quick, I just want to say, for the first gospel reading, we're not going to stand up. Okay. Uh, just for that. I, I apologize. I should have said that. Okay. It can be found on page 1620. <clears throat> now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. <clears throat>
Okay, the gospel reading this morning, if you will stand, is Matthew 12, 1 through 14, and can be found in your Bible on page 1514. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Then Jesus left that place and entered their synagogue. A man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, Is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. He said to them, Suppose one of you has had one sheep, and it fell into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hands and take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And it was restored as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the young ones forward for a time together. Good morning, guys. How are y'all today? Good. Oh, I like your boots. Um, so this morning's passage is one that we've been reading about, right? We've been reading about Sabbath. Y'all were here last week. We talked about Sabbath and what Sabbath meant. Do y'all remember what Sabbath is? The day of rest. That I've come in the last two weeks of really being involved reading about Sabbath. I think that's one of the best definitions of it, a day of rest. And so today's passages are both from the Gospels, and they're both stories where Jesus does something on the Sabbath and that the leaders of the church think that he shouldn't be doing that. And it's really kind of crazy, though, because what is he doing? He's healing people. Don't you think that's kind of crazy to get in trouble for making someone that's sick better? I think so. I mean, it'd be kind of like, let's say you were sick and you had to go to a hospital. And you go to the hospital, right, on a Sunday, and you get there and the doors are closed and you're like knocking on the door and somebody looks out the window and says, I'm sorry, we're closed, it's Sabbath, you gotta come back tomorrow. That'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it? The people were just trying to get Jesus in trouble. And they were trying to find anything to get him in trouble. And what Jesus says to the people and this is going to be the broader point in just a few minutes. If you're helping someone who needs help, if, you, if there's somebody that's hurting, or somebody, if there's if, if, if a sheep falls in a well, you're going to take care of it. And he says to them, you guys do stuff on the Sabbath too that you're not supposed to do. You take care of your animals. And you all raise animals? You can't just on a Sunday not feed the animals, right? You know, every other day, go out, feed them, make sure they have water. But on Sunday, you just look out the window and be like, good luck. You can't do that, right? And that's the point Jesus makes. We have to be able to take care of the people and things that need taken care of, even if it is the Sabbath. All right, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for the 
kids, young people. Thank you for their families. Us, be with them and their families as they go back out into the world. Help them to remember that the Sabbath is important, but loving others and taking care of them is even more important sometimes. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. I'm guessing that my microphone is cutting in and out. Thank you. My lovely wife is going to go get me some batteries just in case. I guess, I guess I talked too much in the early service and my batteries are dying. But that's okay. We'll get new ones and I can talk a lot here too. So this morning's passage... This morning's passage is kind of a continuation of last week, because last week we started talking about Sabbath, and we talked about what is Sabbath. The title of last week's sermon was, Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We talked about the different things that constituted Sabbath, and we talked about what people believed was Sabbath, at least back in that time, and the origins of where Sabbath came from. We also talked about the punishment that came along with violating the Sabbath. If you were here last week, I want to see if you all remember. We talked about the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, and the punishment that was in the book of Numbers. Do you all remember what that punishment was for violating the Sabbath? The guy that was collecting wood? (laughs) He was stoned to death. Thank you. He was stoned to death for collecting wood for a fire on the Sabbath. Then we, we go forward, we, you know, we have that, that's the oldest writings we have, the Old Testament. Then we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were kind of contemporary with Jesus that time, just before, a little bit after. And so we know where Jews are early on with the early writings. And then we have this Dead Sea Scroll time, and that's a kind of contemporary. And so when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls, what was the punishment there in the Damascus document? Seven years in prison for violating the Sabbath. Seven years in prison. So I hope you, like I, if you were here last week, made the decision that it's at least better to live in this time as far as violating the Sabbath than it was back in the day. But if you see, there's this shift There's a shift from very early on of stoning someone to death for collecting wood to then later on seven years in jail for violating the Sabbath. And now, what happens if you violate the Sabbath now? Nothing. Nothing. So that's okay. But we need to remember the Sabbath. We need to keep it holy and remember why it's important. So that was last week. This week, we're talking about Jesus and the Sabbath, and we talk about it because, I'm going to just be honest with you, I did a lot of reading this week about Sabbath stuff, and you're going to find out in a little bit, I really did do a lot of reading. But as we do that, there are people that believe that Jesus came to change everything, including the Sabbath, and say that that's an old law. There are also people who ask the question, shouldn't Jesus observe the Sabbath more than anyone else? He's a rabbi. Shouldn't he be observing the Sabbath? And then yet we will ask today, why did he push the boundaries of what it meant to work on the Sabbath? Because I think if you believe, I mean, if you know some of the stories of Jesus, you'll see that. You'll see that he did push those boundaries, that he did challenge the church leaders. He did do these things, and he, it upset some of them. How many times do you think we see Jesus doing something in the Gospels on the Sabbath that is constituted as work in the eyes of the leaders of the church? If you know the stories of Jesus, there's quite a few. One breakdown I found this week said in just healings on the Sabbath, not plucking grain and some other stuff, but just the healings he did on the Sabbath was ten. Ten times he healed on the Sabbath. Ten times. But that's okay. 
Some people say it's okay because several of those stories are told in more than one gospel, just a little bit different. So it's not really ten, it's more like six. One of the earliest examples we have in Jesus' ministry is found in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. The very beginning of Luke chapter 4, do you all know where Jesus is? He's in Nazareth. And he goes into the synagogue on Sabbath in Nazareth, his hometown, his synagogue that he grew up in. And he walks in, and at some point, he reads from Isaiah, the Isaiah scroll. And he says to, he says to the people there, this prophecy that I just read is me. It's been fulfilled. I'm the Messiah. And if you know anything about that story, the next thing they did was they ran him out of town, up a hill, and tried to throw him off a cliff. The people in his own home church. So that's one Sabbath. Then the following Sabbath, we get this story from Luke 4, later on, starting in verse 31. He went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astounded at his teaching because he spoke with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. All right, there, he's healed someone on the Sabbath. Well, that didn't sit well. And so Jesus leaves the synagogue there in Capernaum, and he goes to Simon's house. Simon later becomes Peter. He goes to Simon Peter's house, and this is, start, picks up at verse 38. After leaving the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. Then he stood over her, rebuked the fever, and it left her. Well, there, he's healed somebody else on the Sabbath. Then the story goes on. Later on, more and more people bring people who are sick to him to heal. So Jesus is doing all of these things early on. Even early on in his ministry, as he's barely proclaiming to be the Messiah, then he's healing people on the Sabbath, and it's upsetting people. It's upsetting people. So we see that he is challenging the norms, at least as far as the leaders of the temple are concerned. He's challenging those norms of what it means to not work on the Sabbath. So our first scripture today, our first gospel reading was from Luke, Luke 13, 10 through 17. Jesus heals a woman who'd been crippled for 18 years, and it just happens to be that this takes place on the Sabbath. He's in the synagogue teaching on the Sabbath. And there's a woman who's been sick and crippled for 18 years. 18 years. Not eight months, not 18 days, 18 years. And he has the nerve to heal her, to make her right on the Sabbath. And when he does this miracle in front of all of these people, what happens? He's chastised for it. It says right here, But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. If you're sick, if you've got something wrong with you, don't come here to the church on Sunday. That's the Sabbath. Stay home. Come on another day. So when we get to this story, we get to the question of what is work? What is constituted as work? So you see, in the Jewish tradition, we've talked about at the very beginning in the book of Numbers, you're put to death. 
for violating the Sabbath. Then you move forward and you get these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in it there's the Damascus document, which talks about a lot of different things about how to live as a Jew in the Essene community, at least we assume it's the Essene community, and it says seven years in jail. But there's this debate all along, and that's the really beautiful thing about the Jewish faith. They are always debating, they are always discussing, and they're always trying to figure out what it means, what the Bible means as it says to them. They're, all, they're never satisfied. It's really beautiful. And so there's this thing called the Talmud, which is this writing from several of these rabbis from way back in the day. And they explain what is work and what is not work. Now, there's a whole lot more to this, but I'm going to read you one very small piece. See if you can follow along, okay? Okay. Rabbi Abba said, one who digs a hole on Shabbat and digs the hole only because he needs its dirt is exempt from that act, which is not the labor of digging prohibited on Shabbat by Torah. And even according to Rabbi Yehuda, who said that in general, one who performs labor that is not necessary for its own sake, i.e., he performs the labor for a purpose other than the direct result of that action, is liable for it. That ruling applies only to a purpose that is constructive. However, this purpose is destructive, as one performs an act that unnecessarily mars the surface of the ground. Therefore, Rabbi Yehuda would agree that in this case, he is exempt. Did y'all follow along? <laughs> Guys, I have a degree in this sort of stuff, and I struggle with it. But it's really interesting to read. And this is just, so that is one paragraph in the Talmud. The Talmud is this, like an encyclopedia full of books. And it's just full of stuff like this, how to live as a Jew. And so it's broken kind of like our Bible is up. It's got these chapters and then it's kind of got verses. And this is one verse and one chapter, if we're comparing it to the Bible, that about digging a hole and not digging a hole. And if you're digging a hole and you deface the ground, it might be okay, but it's not a... Show of hands. How many of y'all are going to dig a hole on the Sabbath? Hopefully... Rabbi Yehuda would think that you are exempt. But we have this. This has been going on for years and years in Jewish culture. When we talk about Jesus being in the synagogue and teaching on the Sabbath, it's not like I'm doing right now. That's not what it was like. What would happen is Jesus or whoever the rabbi was or whoever was in charge that, that uh, Saturday morning or Sunday or whenever they happened to be there would read some scripture just like we do. And then one person would kind of stand up and say a few things, but then guess what happens after that? There's a debate. People throw out ideas. People say, no, you're wrong. I don't think that's right. Let me tell you what I think is right. That's how we get this. Could you imagine? Could you, you know who I could imagine? I could imagine saying something, and this person, who I'm so glad to see back with us, Saying, you know, Jacob, that might not be exactly right. And I would love you anyway. <laughs> but could you imagine a lively debate instead of just someone standing up here every Sunday and telling you what the Bible says? So there's this debate for years about what is work and what isn't work. And Jesus comes along. And where does healing people who are sick fall into that category? Well, let's move on to Matthew. The second scripture we read was Matthew. Oh, before that, I do want to say real quick that Jesus' response to the people in the synagogue when he heals the crippled lady, his response after the whole thing, he does say to them, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? Don't you love Jesus' comebacks? You hypocrites. I like it. Jesus is saying to them, look, you're going to take care of the things you need to take care of. Don't come after me. So we move on now to the Matthew passage, Matthew 12, 1 through 14. And what's going on here? It starts off with Jesus and the disciples walking through what we are told is a grain field. 
and they're on the, it's on the Sabbath, and they're walking through, and the disciples are hungry. Oh, no. So they pluck some grain. Now, a real quick small note. Like I said, I did a lot of reading this week. There are some people who translate that word that we have as grain as ears of corn. So it might have been a cornfield. It might have been a grain field. Either way, they're eating what's there, and it's on the Sabbath, and oh my goodness gracious, should they be doing that? So they, they are walking through this field, and they're plucking food so they can eat because they're hungry, and what happens? The Pharisees see them. Now, here's a question for you. Why are the Pharisees seeing what they're doing in a grain field? That is absolutely right, Bonnie. They are following Jesus. They're following Jesus and the disciples because they're trying to trap him. And we're going to see much later on that that's exactly what's happening. So the Pharisees, at least a few of them, are out walking with Jesus and the disciples, waiting for them to do something so they can catch them. It would be like if I went out and stood in one of y'all's fields that is a rancher on Sunday morning waiting for you to do something, and when I do see you doing something, I'm like, hey! Nobody got it in second service. First service, they got it. Hey. 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 That's why I'm a preacher and not a stand-up. It's very corny. It is. But that'd be exactly what it would be like if the leaders of the church, if me and all the other leaders of our church, the admin chair, if we went out and just made sure you weren't doing something when you shouldn't be doing it and then calling you on it. That's all they're doing. If you ask me, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. So we see that they're following Jesus, and then they say this to Jesus, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Here's something that I realized also this week. My whole life growing up, I've heard this story. And for some reason, I guess I always thought, but until it was pointed out in one of the books I was reading, a guy named Eric Olson wrote this. The Pharisees do not have a question for Jesus they have a statement. They have a statement that we have heard or said too often. We have never done it that way before, <laughs> which is also a nicer way of saying, we've always done it this way. We've never done that before. We've always done it this way. That's what they're saying to him. They're saying, hey, you cannot do that because that's not what we do. I don't care if you're hungry. We don't do that. There's a whole other sermon there about that's not how we do things around here, uh, which will be preached another day. But Jesus knows what he's talking about. And so in answer to his, their statement, which I always thought was a question, but in answer to, his statement, to the statement, Jesus says, have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. David and his men were hungry on the Sabbath. They'd been out doing their things. They come back and they're hungry. What does David do? He goes in to the place, of the tent of worship, the holy of the holies, and he says to the priests, I am hungry, my men are hungry, we've been out, we need food, and they say, here, eat the bread that you're not supposed to eat. This is David, King David, the one that everyone reveres. He did that on the Sabbath. And then Jesus also says, or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? So Jesus turns it on them and says, how dare you say I'm violating the Sabbath? What are you doing? How come you are guiltless and I'm not? What makes you better than me or my disciples? Nothing. He goes on. At the very end of this first part of this passage, 
he says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I told you all, I've been, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been reading all week. I still have not completely wrapped my mind around what that statement means, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. But I'm going to share with you today what I think it means, and if you, if next week my plan is to work on that a little bit more and hopefully be a little bit clearer. But right now, here's what I have. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. God created the Sabbath. Jesus is God. Jesus can decide what does and doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Sounds good, doesn't it? So then, after Jesus does this, after they eat this grain and, or corn, and then they have this discussion, Jesus then goes into their Sabbath. See, they're walking along. This isn't the Sabbath that he always went to. This is uh, to the temple, uh, the synagogue that he always went to. This is a different synagogue. This is a different place. And so he and the disciples go into the synagogue. And what happens there? He walks in and there's a man with a withered hand and the leaders of the synagogue say to him, is it lawful to cure on the Sabbath? Why? So they might accuse him. Jesus answers, suppose one of you has only one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus is saying to them something that is absolutely true. If one of them did have a sheep and it fell into a pit, they were going to save it because that, something might happen to that sheep and that's a valuable sheep and they don't want it to just stay in the pit overnight. Now, I told you that I really did do a lot of reading, and there's a debate about this exact story in some of the Jewish writings. And this is what they came up with. Paraphrased. We're either going to take it out, or do we take it a pillow and a blanket so that it's okay until we can get it out tomorrow? That's the debate that they're having. Now, please don't, don't think I'm standing up here and making fun of Jewish writings and Jewish, the Jewish faith. I love this stuff. I love that this debate goes on. I love that people are so passionate about it, that they will come up and just sit there. We went, when I was in Israel, to this thing called a yeshiva, which is like a seminary for rabbis. And that's all they do all day is just sit there and talk about the passages that they have and just how does it look. And they use some of this stuff. It's just beautiful. Why don't we do more of that? Why are we so passive? So Jesus walks up to this man. And he says, stretch out your hand. And he stretches out his hand, and before he knows it, both of the hands look exactly the same. He heals the man. He takes care of this ailment, and he's healed. And then there is this thing, there's this word that I learned in college that I love and I use occasionally. Right after he heals the man, there's a kerfluffle. The people, the Pharisees, get upset. There's this anger. Because he healed this man. He healed him on the Sabbath. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. How? To destroy him. How to destroy him. Because he he had the nerve to heal someone on the Sabbath. Two things. The first is, of all the Jewish writing that I read, it's very clear that it's okay in the Jewish faith. If someone is hurting, if someone is in emergency, if they are dying or they're sick, or if there's something going on that, they need to be, that needs to be taken care of immediately, it supersedes the Sabbath. 
like I said to the kids, you're not going to tell them, I'm sorry, the hospital's not open till tomorrow. I'm sorry that that's happening to you. I hope you survive until we can get you there tomorrow. That's not what they believe. They believe you can take care of things that need to be taken care of. But because it's Jesus. And they're trying to destroy him. Almost every story we read about him doing something on the Sabbath, it angers the leaders and they try to get him. Now I want to point out the irony of something here though. We know that Jesus doing these things, healing people on the Sabbath is a horrible thing, that the Pharisees don't like it. Well, guess what? I also read this week the biggest irony of all. You know when Jesus gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and then they take him to the trial in front of the Sanhedrin, which is leaders of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that come together, they take him in front of them and guess what? Nothing, nothing in that trial was legal under Jewish law. You can't have a trial at night. You can't have a trial without someone being there to support Jesus. You have to have witnesses that are truthful. You can't do it on the Sabbath or on the day before the Sabbath or during a festival. All of those things and many others were happening. So these people who are trying to get Jesus because he's healing sick people on the Sabbath violate a bunch of rules because they want him crucified because he's that much of a thorn in their side. After I read that, and I said this earlier, I really wish that Jesus, either in that trial or at some point, once again said to them, you hypocrites. So this is just two of the several stories of Jesus maybe violating the Sabbath. So the question at the beginning I had was, did Jesus come to change the Sabbath? Did he come to change the laws? Did he come to make things different? There are people who believe that, that Jesus is the new commandment. That the old commandments get thrown out, the Ten Commandments, because Jesus has come. I don't believe that's accurate. I believe we still have to live under those rules. But I also believe in grace and mercy. Judith Shulevitz writes this. When it came to the the Sabbath, the historical Jesus would have had reform, not revolution, in mind. He was a reform rabbi, not a Jew for Jesus. What that saying is, is Jesus didn't come to overthrow everything and change everything and just completely do a revolution. He came to reform, to make things better, to show a better way that they can do these things. Jesus came to show the religious leaders that there's better ways to do things with everyone in mind and that love, not the law, should be their driving force and factor. Love, not the law. Jesus said this in Matthew 22. He's asked, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What does that mean? That means that the two most important things in Jesus' eyes, and Jesus is God, so in God's eyes, are that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. And then all the other ones come after that, that those are the two most important So guess what? Sabbath doesn't make that list of the greatest commandments. It's number four. So it's hung on those. Do everything in the law, but when needed be, love God, love your neighbor, and everything else is hung on that. What Jesus is saying is the law is important. But if you don't love God and love your neighbor and do anything to make sure they're okay, then you've missed the whole point. The whole point of all of this 
is how I am going to move forward, and I hope you will too. I shall love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and with all my mind. And I shall love my neighbor as myself. Jesus doesn't come to change anything. He comes to show that the most important thing of all is love for your fellow man and making sure that they are okay. Love God, love people, and then everything else will fall into place. Jesus doesn't change it. He enhances it. Amen. We now come to that time in our worship service in which we gather together. We gather together as the people and the children of God, and we come together as the body of Christ, and we share with one another the joys and concerns that are on our hearts and minds. And then with one voice, we lift those concerns and joys to God. And this morning, I'll share a few prayer concerns and joys with you, and then I'll share the, what's on the cards uh, that I've received both in the early service and this service. We start off as we do and have been. We lift up all of those who are sick, all of those who have an illness. We especially lift up those who are suffering from or had uh, long-term effects from COVID, those who have lost a loved one to COVID. We continue to pray for those folks. Leslie Johnson also asked for prayers on that, in that vein that Jack and Judy, her sister-in-law, uh, they both have COVID, uh, but they are doing well. And so we just lift up and pray uh, for her, for her family. I also lift up, as I do, all of the leaders around the world. My prayer always is, and I hope yours is, that as leaders around the world seek to make decisions, that they do so with the guidance of God, and as they do, that the decisions are made for the betterment of all people and not for self-interest. We continue to lift up and pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for all of the people that were in the path of Hurricane Nicholas. It could have been much worse. It wasn't as bad, but there are still people who lost a lot. And so we lift them up. One of the joys that's also a concern this morning is we have been praying for one of our youth who had a, um, uh, she had a, a seizure a couple weeks ago during a track meet. We lifted her up in prayer. She has gone home. And so she is doing better, but she still needs prayers and so for healing, continued healing, and so we lift her up. And we also lift up Dick Looney, who is much improved, and we celebrate that. That's Terry Godwin's father. So we just lift up those two folks as well. <clears throat> One of the joys that I had written down on my list and I received a card is cooler fall weather. This is my favorite week, favorite time of the year, the first cold front's coming. Thursday's lows are supposed to be 53 I'm excited. I love the cold weather, and I know, I know that other people do too. Here's what I will say to that, though. I also say um, that this has been a very mild summer compared to others. Uh, we were here for half a summer last year, and it was pretty brutal heat-wise. This year has been pretty good, and so I give thanks for that and prayers uh, for not a horrible winter uh, this coming winter. We also have been asked to lift up bow fields. We also lift up Stacy as her pain has gotten better and her blood pressure is better. We still ask for, she's still asking for prayers and also for her friend Susan. Uh, a couple of joys that were list, lifted up. Um, one is from Jen, and I'm glad she wrote this. Um, there are lots of birthdays in our family last week and this week. Uh, this last week, uh, her dad had his birthday and my niece Taylor and my brother Chris celebrated a birthday. And this coming week, um, actually, today is Jen's mom's birthday, 
And then later this week is my sister's birthday. So this two weeks is pretty busy birthday-wise for our family. And so just celebrate birthdays for all of these people in our lives. I also want to share uh, Larry and Marianne Eckerman lifted up a joy, a praise that the Washington County Fair was a large success. The Junior Livestock Auction broke a record in sales. And I learned something new this morning. Our granddaughter, th their granddaughter, Sienna, sold her eighth place carcass hog and did really well. I learned that people sell dead hogs at the fair. <laughs> when I first moved to Carrizo, I had to learn the difference between a heifer and a steer. Now that I've moved here, I've learned that people sell carcass hogs and make money on it. Um, but that's great. I am so excited. I saw lots of pictures from the fair. It looked like it was a great time. Um, and, probably, and it was really good weather. So I, I definitely celebrate that. And all of the youth uh, that, took play, that took part in that. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we want an owner's manual, a how-to guide for our faith. Rules and regulations, time constraints seem to dominate our lives. And we often forget the most basic understanding for our faith. That is our relationship to God through you. God has drawn us here today, drawn us here to be healed, to listen, to be encouraged in our service to God's word. We have lifted up names of dear ones who struggle with a host of issues and situations over which we feel powerless. Remind us again that your power is sufficient for their needs and ours. They are all in your loving care. Help us to place our trust and our confidence in you. Let us feast on the bread of life who has given to us the best example of what it truly means to serve you and witness to your love. Encourage us to serve you more fully. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and in his name we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As our time together comes to a close this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able for our hymn of invitation. It's in your insert in the bulletin, and it will also be on the screen. It's a new song. Um, the choir, I have heard, has been practicing on it, and so I'm very excited about that. They're going to lead us. But I've asked that Sharon and Elaine would play it through one time and then make sure you tell us when it's time to start. Um, but uh, I want you all to hear it. It's a song called Days of Elijah. It's, it's a really good song. It'll be in your head all week, I promise. Um, but that is our closing, our, our hymn of invitation this morning. I invite you to stand as you are able.
thank y'all. We'll see that again soon, I promise. But thank y'all for taking on something new, and thank y'all as well. Uh, one short announcement is uh, that uh, the tickets are still on sale for the UMW uh, dinner on October 6th. It's the prime rib and dessert. It's going to be yummy. Uh, UMW ladies have tickets. Um, see one of them if you need it. You can't buy them there. You've got to buy it before. So make sure you do. Um, it's a Wednesday night drive through pickup uh, meal. So I just invite you to uh, support our ladies in that. As you go... May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.